Uh, it's been really interesting to watch all these presentations in the past couple days. Um, it seems to be very plant focused, so I might be not very popular after my presentation. <laughs> uh, okay, we got it. Uh, I'm actually making a film about this. So my film's called Food Lies, and I think they're trying to pull up the... Our scavenging ancestors would go in after a carnivore killed another animal and get the leftovers. So we get the most nutrient-dense part of that animal. She is taking the nutrients in the grass and the nutrients in the sunlight and turning them into vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K. It takes a hundred years for land that's plowed one time for it to return to all the species that were there before the day it was plowed. We've been eating meat, cheese, butter, eggs for all of human history. So how is it that we came to believe that these things are bad for us? Yeah, that's kind of my message there. <laughs> so I think we've got everything backwards and that we're headed in the wrong direction. I'm presenting on why we should be including more animal foods in our diet, not less. Animal rights activists have taken over the conversation in the last 50 years and skewed the data and infected our culture into just assuming meat is bad for us and the planet without ever investigating if this is scientific fact. This is a story about humans and what we require to thrive and how our environment has a perfect natural system that needs animal inputs and healthy soil. Humans, plants, animals, the soil, bacteria, we've all evolved together. You can't just take one out of the system. Yet somehow people these days think that that's the case and that we'd be better off by doing so. The main thing I want to leave you with today is that you've been deceived. Meat is not hurting the environment or your precious little insides. There's 3.5 million years of meat eating that made us human and continue to keep us healthy today. Let's see the evidence by going through a six step journey beginning with how we evolved. This is what early humans were eating. These animals made up the majority of our diet. There was plenty of megafauna roaming the earth and all major continents. We could easily hunt these animals and they provided us with a bounty of fatty meat. We know this from radioisotope nitrogen levels from early human remains. There's actually over 27 lines of evidence showing early humans were high trophic level carnivores, the top of the food chain. We use tools in our superior intellect to become the apex predator. This changed our digestive system. We evolved away from subsisting on low quality plant foods and instead required highly nutrient dense animal foods. We can't ferment large amounts of plant foods like our ancestors. Our small intestine got longer where we extracted nutrition from meat and the hindgut got shorter where plant fermentation takes place. We're a completely different species now requiring different nutrition. Scientists believe early humans began scavenging carcasses. This slowly changed our stomach pH from our primate ancestors to something very acidic to be able to handle this. Our stomach acid pH is lower than many carnivores and similar to another scavenger, the hyena. There's much more of the science, but the point is we became human because of meat and animal fat. This is how our brains grew and we evolved from, our plant, from plant eaters. Our bodies evolved to thrive on the nutrition from meat and animal fat and substitutes aren't as good. This data is from modern hunter-gatherers, which give us a window into our past. Although many giant animals died out, so we were forced to eat more plant foods. But as you can see, most societies are animal-based. Plants are a side dish or something we ate when we couldn't get an animal. We study these societies and find that plants are fallback foods. So what happened? For all of history, we knew animals were the pillar of health. We lost our way. We had some bad theories and did some bad science. So we have foods we've been eating for all of history over here, and then we have an influx of highly processed foods. We then went through 70 years of blaming health problems on red meat. This is deception number one. Processed foods, sugar, refined grains, and vegetable oils are the real problem, not meat. They have the most damaging health effects. So how did we get this wrong? We had a heart disease epi epidemic in the 50s and jumped to some conclusions. A guy named Ansel Keys had some sp made some spurious correlation. There was another scientist named John Yudkin that had the correct theory, but Ansel Keys won out. We'll skip this, it'll be covered in my film. But basically, we made mistakes and wrongly demonized cholesterol and saturated fat which opened the door to the processed food industry, low fat products, and the fat is bad paradigm. This led to the food pyramid with a base of processed carbohydrates and a call to limit meat, eggs, butter, and especially red meat. And guess what happened? Our health rapidly deteriorated. Obesity and chronic disease took off and 
And people say, well, uh, you know, we didn't really, you know, follow the guidelines. Well, we did. We followed them well. Butter went down. Eggs went down. Red meat went down. Grains and sugars skyrocketed. If meat is so bad for us, then why did all our health problems start as meat and animal fat declines? Nobody is talking about this side of things. So we have a ton more questionable science. This is just one example. When the WHO panel decided meat was a carcinogen, they ignored counter evidence. Even the studies they did look at, it was a toss up, 15 to 14, for if red meat was good or bad. And note, these were correlational studies. And guess what? There's only a 0.18% risk factor compared to smoking, which was a 10 to 30% risk factor. These are completely different situations. So we have to move on to the nutrition story. Plants have a lower bioavailability of nutrients. We can't get the same nutrition from them. Even what's listed on the package or on the USDA food list is not accurate. Our body is not able to absorb all the nutrients. While animal foods do allow us to get more from them, red meat and things like eggs actually pro provide the most nutrient-dense, complete nutrition on Earth. Look at this quote from a peer-reviewed scientific study. Plant-based foods are the major cause of deficiencies because of their lack of bioavailable nutrition. Plant sources of omega-3 have very low bioavailability. It's converted to usable DHA at only 0 to 4 percent. That's terrible. However, you can get fully formed DHA, iodine, and iron from seafood and other animal foods. Protein in beef is almost three times as bioavailable than in beans. If you're not eating beef, you'd have to eat three times the calories to get the same protein. This is the opposite of what we need in a diabetes and obese world. Yet somehow, it's taboo to talk about the benefits of beef. Let's look at sardines. Although liver would be healthier, orders of magnitude more nutrition than so-called healthy plant foods. Through all our cultivation, a lot of fruit is basically just a bunch of sugar. Okay, moving on to new science. We've found out a lot more since the days where we thought fat and meat were bad for you. Here's some data showing how we got saturated fat wrong. In the European population, death rate actually goes down with higher saturated fat intake. We also got cholesterol wrong. Limits on cholesterol have been quietly taken off the dietary guidelines. Nobody's heard about that, I'm guessing. No. This is a lot to take in, but every blood mark, including the patient's weight, improved with a low-carb, high-fat, high-animal foods diet. Triglycerides got better, HCL better, glucose, everything. Not what the news outlets are reporting on, not what the public has heard. Then we have people like Dr. Eric Westman, who works with very low-income people in North Carolina and reverses diabetes and obesity with cheap grocery store beef, eggs, and even McDonald's patties. We should be lowering glucose and insulin, not meat, for longevity and health. The real dangerous diet is one of constant glucose and insulin spikes from processed carbs and sugar. So like I said, a lot of science out there, huge amount of studies showing the superior effects of low-carb diets, which most often are high animal foods and definitely high fat. There are now over 100 studies, actually, not what's being reported in the media. One study showed a, a high-fat diet reversing type 2 diabetes in 60% of patients after one year. Amazing miracle study, zero coverage in the media. Very strange, if you ask me. Now, there's some people who are curing a lot of health conditions by only eating meat. These guys are carnivores. They're, they're a little extreme. For example, these two have eaten nothing but steak for 19 years. They're basically aging in reverse. This is how our ancestors ate, so it's not surprising our bodies do very well eating like this. Since eating mostly animal foods, I've never felt better. I have endless energy, I no longer get sick, and much more. It's not just me, there's thousands of these, tens of thousands of these people. So, now to a super important issue, the environment. Before we begin, I have to say, the meat we have today, even conventionally grown in feedlots, is perfectly healthy and nutritious. It's basically the same as we've been always eating. I hate to support conventional feedlots, but I guess that's what I'm here to do in this little talk today. First of all, why are we talking about animal agriculture when it comes to greenhouse gases and climate change? It's deception number two and a smokescreen by animal rights activists to stop us from eating meat. The real problem is fossil fuels. These three industries are 80% of the emissions. If people really cared about emissions and food, they'd be telling people to eat less rice, which produces tons of methane. They'd also tell people not to eat potato chips, which are the number one producer of greenhouse gases. Yes, potato chips have the number one carbon footprint for food. <clears throat> the methane cows produce is part of a cycle. This is very important, everyone. Methane is a short-lived gas. It only stays around for 10 years. It's a flow gas. 
meaning it's recycled. It goes from the grass into the cow into the air and then back into the grass. We don't have more cows than 45 years ago. The herd size has actually stayed the same. So cattle is not the issue. But CO2 stays around for a thousand years. It's a stock gas, meaning it's a one-way street. We get it deep within the ground and it goes into the atmosphere. This is the real problem. This is what we should be worried about. Here's another view of the difference between fossil fuel CO2 emissions compared to food production and all other land uses. Which do you think the problem is? Calculations about land use are misleading. 85% of land for grazing cattle can't be farmed. What would we do with this valuable land? That is more of the stuff you don't hear about. Now we need to talk about the soil. Plants and crops mainly take from the soil, while animals give back to the soil. Remember this, plants take nutrients and need fossil fuel inputs. Animals give back to the soil with their urine and their manure. The health of, health of a nation is dependent on its soil. This is where carbon is sequestered. Tilling the soil and growing monocrops ruins the soil. Many farms are using animals on pasture and are actually putting more carbon into the soil than they're producing. That's right. Only about 11% of a cow's diet over their life is edible to humans. They are not competing with us for food. Modern cows are actually adapted to eat grains and they only eat them for a few months. They are fed leftover products from the creation of biofuels. It's a great system. They are recyclers. They also eat leftovers from distilling alcohol. These are things that would just go to waste otherwise and certainly aren't edible to humans. Cows take poor quality protein and turn it into high quality bioavailable protein. Cattle doubles the amount of usable protein from the food that they consume. This means calculations are off that you may have heard. They're not considering the bioavailability of the protein cows produce. Yes, they have to eat a lot and they produce some methane, but they upcycle the nutrients. This is nature's miracle. We should be embracing it. Now this might be the biggest prehistoric sized elephant in the room we should be talking about. What's the alternative? Spoiler alert, there is no good one. Calculations about feeding the world with only plants are incorrect. In many ways, let's dive into this. The alternative is we would just have to grow millions more acres of pesticide soaked corn, wheat and soy. People talk about meat like there's some magical free source of food with no impact. Remember, monocropping is the real problem. We don't have another way to grow enough food to replace meat. And this food isn't a good replacement nutritionally anyway. What about the ethical argument? 25 times more sentient animals die producing crops. Not to mention how many habitats and entire ecosystems are devastated clearing the land for monocropping. Animals are going to die for any food you produce, so you might as well get the good nutrition by eating them. Nobody is talking about this. There's no alternative or happy ending for animals in the wild. The cruel reality is they either starve or get eaten alive. Animal agriculture actually gives animals an extremely safe, comfortable life with temperature controlled habitats and vets on site giving them perfect nutrition. Then they go through rigorous standards in the US for a quick, painless death. Cows provide so many other products. How many fossil fuels would it take to replace them? There are over 400 products produced from cattle. This is something very few people think about in this discussion. It would take massive amounts of energy and synthetic products to replace these. Worldwide, livestock farming helps the poorest billion people the most. It gives them year-round food, goods, work, and other products. It is more stable than crops, which are subject to weather and infestation. We're sitting here and here in a thousand dollar conference thinking we know what's best for the world. The main environmental footprint of the food supply is food waste. Globally, globally we waste 40% of all food and most of this is plant food. Animals can utilize this waste food. So maybe we should cut down on plant foods to help this problem. That's an interesting one to think about. All right, let's recap here. Humans evolved to require nutrient dense animal foods and meat made us human. We've lost our way only in the past 60 years. All other times in history we prized animal foods. Animal foods have all the bioavailable nutrition. Plant foods have anti-nutrients, and much of the nutrients can't be absorbed. We have countless studies proving meat is healthy in a diet that's healthy without sugar or processed carbs. The real problem is fossil fuels, and the animal act activists shift the blame to red meat. And also, the alternative is much worse. So, animals are the solution to our health and environmental problems. Cows are nature's miracle. They're part of a natural and beautiful cycle. So how do we feed the growing world? We do have enough land. We actually produce enough food already to feed 10 billion people. It's just a really a mismanagement problem. Surprisingly, 80% of America and 75% of the world is fed by small family farms. We have a decent system currently, but yes, it's not perfect and we can improve it. 
The sure way to not feed our world is to continue with this monocropping of corn, wheat, and soy. This could actually ruin our soil and be our downfall. Thank you.